Thank you, Tamar. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, we are uh, very excited to be talking about this CEO uh, transition case studies and, and some of the work of Leading Edge. What we're going to do, as Tamar mentioned, there's going to be some time for Q&A at the end. So what we wanted is uh, the um, uh, for the first 45 minutes or so for us to be uh, in conversation. Uh, so for Eben and I to speak about uh, some of the stories that came out from our CEO succession case studies and the work that we've been doing about search committees uh, and then open it up. Uh, for the last 15 minutes or so for some Q&A. Um, and as Tamar said, if there are anything that comes up in the intervening time, uh, we would love for this to be a conversation. So before we kick it off, and I have tons of questions for Eben as we've been working together and, and collecting some stories, I just wanted to give a bit of background to uh, Leading Edge, which Tamar framed really beautifully, uh, which was uh, for the last five years, we've been working on this leadership pipeline issue uh, it's uh, by some it's looked at as a crisis. We're very good at crises in the Jewish community, by the way. Uh, and what we uh, we were first thought to see this as a challenge, we see as a tremendous opportunity in that the vast majority of leaders in the Jewish community and society, by the way, this is a demographic shift that's happening writ large, um, are turning over and have been for the last five years. And this is a, a trend that will continue for uh, certainly the, the years to come. And that time, that transition time is such an opportunity for for an organization. And when we started working on the work <clears throat> of Leading Edge, thinking like, oh my God, our leaders like the Barry Shraves of the world at Combined Jewish Philanthropy, like the Ruth Messengers of the world at American Jewish World Service and on and on, are turning over, who's got next? The funders really behind Leading Edge said, oh my God, we really haven't talked about this and, and thought about this and, and led in this way to be able to hedge this vulnerability for our community. And that's really the genesis of our work at Leading Edge. That's really our purpose. And one of the things that we've been looking at is, well, what does that CEO search and succession process look like? Because this is the pivotal moment within an organization's life that can have you know, years of, of impact and reverberations and potentially consequences. And that led us to understand that CEOs are selected by search committees and these search committees are made by volunteers, oftentimes volunteers who have never done the search before. And so we thought, how can we make it easier? for these individuals to actually uh, make this search process smoother, uh, potentially engendered with some of the best practices in there. And that's what led us to a partnership with Eben, uh, which we, uh, somebody we found through LinkedIn of all things. It was, uh, it was our, uh, our chief operating officer, Morty Walfish, who um, we've been reading many of the thought leaders and of uh, related to leadership and really loved Eben's work as he is a senior editor at the Harvard Business Review, reached out to him and said, can we, can we put together like a Cliff's Notes for these search committees, like a guide that will titrate and distill down the most important aspects of CEO search so that when a band of volunteer leaders are looking for their next Barry or, or the next leader of uh, Organization X, that they're able to, to do so without having to, to learn and relearn and reinvent the wheel all the time. And that's what uh, led us to a partnership with Evan, um, a prolific journalist who uh, really enjoyed his pieces of time and The Economist and um, Washington Post, et cetera. And that was our first foray into this CEO search and transition kind of process. And then it was about really a year ago when uh, we were at a breakfast with Robert Bank, the current uh, CEO and, and president of American Jewish World Service, and Ruth Messenger, who said, you know what, why do we keep on just complaining about all the bad that's happening in our community and all of those transitions that are not going well? There are transitions that are going well, and we know that we can unpack that. And what are some of those success stories or at least bright spots that we might be able to lift up and learn from? And that's what got us to this, uh, to ask the question, well, what, what are some of those stories out there of CEO succession that was done with integrity, with thoughtfulness, and, and turned out actually very well, and we might be able to learn from. And that's, that's really our, our uh, main topic of, of uh, this wonderful webinar is, is teasing out some of those stories and understanding what are some of those threads, how we might be able to compare ourselves to the private sector, how, how do we do CEO transitions and search, and uh, what were some of the stories that were unearthed. 
So that's our context, and uh, and I'd love to now uh, kick us off actually with uh, a question to Evan, who uh, this is the first time that actually he and I have been able to uh, really talk shop in this way and and uh, go beyond some of the stories that we tried to fashion. Um, and Evan, as a, as a first question to you, I'm wondering, you know, you talk to uh, over 30 people through through this process, and even double that when we were putting together the CO search committee guide. And specifically as, as it relates to these six transitions, what were some of the themes that came up for you that uh, were salient as, as you gathered stories for these six, uh, for these six uh, transitions? Yeah, thanks, Golly. I, I mean, the first thing I'd note is there was sort of a universal recognition of the importance of storytelling um, when it came to uh, you know, helping other nonprofits walk the walk that, you know, a lot of the people that I interviewed, um, search committee members, uh, uh, ex exiting CEOs, entering CEOs had gone through. And um, uh, that was really refreshing because, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of sort of image management that goes on in the corporate world. And what I found was um, that everyone was incredibly forthcoming about some of the uh, things they did well and some of the some of the challenges that they faced. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think the result is a really vibrant uh, series of case studies that really kind of, um, you know, uh, pr presents a human face of some of to, 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 to the sort of rarefied world of like uh, chief executive um, transitions. I guess like the headline, um, you know, shouldn't be surprising is, uh, you know, the thing that kind of came, came away was this idea of the importance of planning. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really what separates smooth secessions from um, rocky ones. And, you know, there is such a thing as an emergency secession. You know, there, there, there are CEOs that, you know, get hit by a bus, God forbid, or get poached for another organization and you're left scrambling to find, um, you know, a, a replacement. But too often organizations turn every secession into an emergency secession because they haven't done the planning. And that's one of the things that I... Um, you know, I, I noted in, in, you know, in, in the interviews. Um, the other thing to say, the flip side of that, if there are listeners who are panicking because they might be facing a secession, they don't feel like they planned as well for it as they could have, is it's not a death sentence, right? Like, you know, um, there were organizations that we interviewed uh, that, um, you know, it took, uh, it took some scrambling and it took some time um, uh, to, 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 you know, but they were able to come away with a successful, uh, secession, even when it wasn't completely sort of locked out in, in March step, but uh, or in lock, marched out in lockstep. Um, but uh, you know, I thought, um, do you mind if we start with Spurtis? I mean, that felt like a really sort of interesting. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. So Spurtis was. Um, I mean, if you wanted to write a textbook example of a smooth and a, and a well a well run transition, um, Spurtis, which is an educational institution in Chicago, really kind of nailed it. Right. So. This idea that um, secession planning starts with leadership and staff development, you know, so arguably it starts decades before a transition event takes place. That's literally what happened in the case of Spurtis, right? So Dean Bell, who's now the um, uh, the CEO, he joined, I think, in his early to mid twenties, yeah. as a in the hallway, right? And um, he ended up being promoted and uh, developed. He became, um, gosh, I have it here, director of distance education, then associate dean, then dean and chief academic officer, then vice president and provost. And, you know, so he was being groomed uh, for decades um, and, and, and allowed to kind of grow as, as a leader. And that involved um, not just promotions, not just more responsibility, but just good management, right? Like he was given space to follow his own interests, you know, long before Google was giving all of its employees 20% time off, he was given time to, you know, one day a week to go do his academic work, etc. That helped everything kind of keep everything fresh. And then when it came to kind of walking the last mile, which is often, you know, so you can do everything right. Um, but the last mile, the last step to the corner office is always the most difficult. Hmm. And that's where, um, you know, Hal Lewis, uh, who was the incumbent CEO, uh, that's where he did this incredible job. Now, now he's in a unique situation. How literally teaches courses on leadership transitions in Jewish communities. So uh, he had the chance to sort of practice what he was preaching. Um, but he essentially told the board when it came time to renew a three-year contract that uh, he would take it, but it would be his last. He would freeze his pay so that he could uh, set up the the, the 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 money that he would have otherwise taken towards uh, leadership development. 
it, and he would take it upon himself to identify and present a successor to the board. And then he spent three years with Dean essentially developing those last mile skills that Dean required. And those were things like global finances. Dean had run the financials for uh, departments, but never globally. It included um, an understanding of how to present to the board and how to communicate to the board, uh, how to meet with donors. And crucially, what I think was interesting was that Hal didn't just sort of like, you know, undertake classroom learning with Dean. He allowed him to practice leadership. So he would literally like hand the PowerPoint slides to Dean in front of the board. He would literally allow Dean to take the lead on um, donor meetings. And I think that that's kind of crucial because uh, there are there are things about uh, being a CEO that you just can't experience as a number two. Uh, and so uh, by the time um, it came, by the time his his you know his final three year contract was coming to a close. Uh, how was able to present this sort of nearly finished groomed candidate to the board and, and sort of say, you know, it's up to you whether you want to put him against a, a national, you know, but this is, you know, this is the person that I'm, you know, that I, that, that, that I put forward to you as part of my goal. And, and you know, and Hal has a nice metaphor. He talks about, you know, in, um, in uh, this idea of like a candle lighting another candle, that your, your flame does not diminish uh, when you pass on the torch. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience, I think, for everyone involved. And, um, you know, really, as I say, just this incredible sort of textbook example yeah. of how, how to run a succession. Yeah. And for those organizations who, who don't do that, since we know that the nature of work is changing. It, it used to be very much a career ladder. Now it's a lattice. People like jump and this and that. Mm -hmm. There are not enough deans in the world who, who stay for, you know, decades. Um, did you hear other stories of, of ways that there could be homegrown type of uh, talent that can get ready? And that, that final mile, I love that image because you're right. There's, there is that, you know, there's that little bit that just makes all the difference. Um, so were there any stories there that, that came up as, as uh a little bit less textbooky, but um, you know. yeah, that's right. I mean, I, so the first thing I'd say is that you know um, you're right. I mean, average you know the ten years that organizations have plummeted, people are bouncing around. There's this idea of sort of you know uh, the tour of duty career, right? So, you go, you fulfill it. Exactly. Um, it's coming, you know, it's being driven largely by Silicon Valley um, and uh, Reid Hoffman and others. Um, uh, the first thing I'd say is that. Um, you know, that's not necessarily fatal for leadership development um, for two reasons. One, uh, executives do come back. And in fact, Dean Bell left Spurtis for two years in the middle of his career to go work at DePaul. And he sort of feels that that experience was crucial. So, you know, I think, you know, it's always good practice for managers um, uh, and CEOs and indeed boards to sort of let go lightly and sort of mm -hmm. Don't burn bridges when people leave. Don't assume that, that, you know, it's forever broken. You know, oftentimes you have, you know, people will leave, go off, grow. Uh, you know, maybe they'll, uh, maybe they'll spend some time at home with their family and then come back to the workplace. There are these uh, instances where you don't assume that you've lost an employee. That's first of all. Second of all, there's actually research um, out of, uh, by Joseph Bauer at Harvard Business School that, um, executives, what he calls insider outsider leaders or outsider insider leaders. I can't quite remember which, but the general gist is that, uh, the best leaders statistically, and he, you know, he, he did, uh, you know, analysis of shareholder value creation before and after leadership transitions. The best leaders statistically are actually those that have, you know, not been totally in, in, enculturated, have spent time outside of an organization, have come in. They've spent maybe three or four years at least at the organization, but they still have sort of an, a global outsider's perspective. Hmm. So I do think that you can orchestrate a successful transition in an era of job hopping and short tenures. Mm -hmm. But what, what it still requires is that the CEO and the board both see it as the CEO's duty to, a CEO's duty, not their only duty, but a CEO's duty to plan for their potential successor and have someone, uh, you know, in mind, um, have opportunities for others that might not be present, immediately jump to mind, but might, you know, surprise you with their opportunity, with their ability to grow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, that the real, the 
a duty of a CEO to think about their succession. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the story you unpack with AJWS, American Jewish World Service. And, you know, the board, there's almost like a, you know, triangulation there. The board obviously plays a role. There's the incumbent CEO, as you put it, there's the potentially handpicked, you know, successor. And um, it can get dicey at times and, and certainly not linear. And I'm wondering if you can unpack that a bit. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, you know, there's a beautiful way to think about a CEO's success, a CEO succession as the last great act or the last act of the great CEO, right? This is their last sort of like final act of value creation for the organization. Um, but oftentimes long serving incumbent CEOs don't immediately see it that way, right? Um, you know, uh, they're shocking. They're, you know, yeah. you know I, I'm sympathetic, right? I mean, um, if, you're, if you are vital, if the organization essentially uh, has grown up under your leadership, if you're a long-serving CEO, it's difficult to transition your mindset to think of, uh, you know, sustainable, intergenerational sustainability. Um, but that's ultimately, you know, uh, the job of the board and the CEO is to sort of, um, to think of kind of uh, stewardship. Um, mm. uh, and so, you know, so, so AJWS, so, Ruth Messenger is this um, incredible woman uh, who I had the privilege of spending an hour with on the phone. Um, you know, had high profile figure in, you know, the American community, not just yes. the Chinese community. Yes. Yeah. Um, had essentially, uh, it wasn't the founder of AJWS, but essentially it becomes synonymous with the organization uh, through her sort of tireless kind of, um, uh, efforts and imagination have really kind of grown the organization to become one of the leaders in international development. Um, and, uh, when the board came to her to talk about a secession plan, you know, it was, the timing was they had just finished a strategic plan with the board. I think the board felt sort of empowered by that activity. And felt that the time, you know, the timing was right. They were starting to hear from some of the donors and others. The timing was right to th start thinking about the next chapter for AJWS. And Ruth Messenger's response, which you know she'll, she'll she will admit to, was the only way I'm leaving my office is feet first. Right. That's that's exactly what she said. Like I'm not going essentially. Um, and this is not an uncommon situation. And so the way that the board handled it. Um, uh, the steps that they took to help bring her along and see that it was an opportunity to cement her legacy. And, you know, credit where credit is due, Ruth's ability to uh, go from such sort of an entrenched position to explore all other alternatives, to work through what a, a secession might mean was, um, you know, was courageous on, on all sides. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that helped was this idea that a seat that a you know a C, for someone in Ruth's position, it doesn't necessarily mean retirement. I mean, there's this sense, you know, there have been management scholars that write about this idea of you know stepping down from the corner office is the step into the abyss. You know, it's so tied up with your identity, um, and especially when it's coming towards the end of your career, it can feel like you're being robbed of something incredibly personal. And so. I don't, you know, there's always the danger with an outgoing CEO that, you know, the board just out of, you know, frustration just essentially creates an empty role for them to make it easier, easier psychologically for them to imagine stepping down. Okay, you can keep your office and we'll give you all these uh, tasks to take care of, but only because, you know, we, we can't figure out any other way to get rid of you, essentially. Right. right. That's not what happened with Ruth. You know, what uh, Robert Bank, who was um, her long serving, uh, uh, well, not actually long serving, but um, innovative and valued number two, mm -hmm. uh, polished number two, who was ready to take a CEO role and was in fact getting offers um, for leadership positions elsewhere. Uh, he was really empowered to sort of work with Ruth to come up with a role that made sense for the organization. And that, you know, that included essentially telling Ruth that he didn't want her to, to hold an office. He couldn't justify the, the cost in downtown Manhattan. He felt it would be difficult for the staff. Um, and so the way they manage that relationship and, you know, that you can, it, as we write about in the case study, they actually use an executive coach um, to sort of go through the timeline of the transition. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in the end, it was kind of one of these examples where there wasn't much planning in place. Uh, they were maybe started behind the eight ball, um, but through the dedication of the board, uh, through Ruth's uh, ability to grow uh, and see this as an opportunity, through Robert's ability to step up and fill kind of a potential vacuum, um, they made it. They, you know, they made a successful transition out of it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And such a story. I mean, really, like, the, I remember when we were when we were thinking about this case series. At first, we thought we would only do a case study on AJWS. I mean, that was that was our initial thought. And then you were the one who pushed back and said, no, 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 there's actually there's a variety of ways to do this succession. And and there's a variety of ways that we can showcase that. And um, and uh, and yeah, and obviously, AJWS story is super rich, especially given the 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 ways in which things unfolded, the role of the board and um, yeah. and certainly the, the two. Programs. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. Right. I mean, it, it, like the interviewing it, it kind of became like Roshimon, I think is the name of the Japanese film where like everyone has a different <laughs> perspective. And yes. It goes to show how yes. emotionally laden these things are. Right. Yeah. Like eyewitness accounts don't become particularly reliable after something this emotional. And you could feel the emotion both from the board, um, you know, who felt uh, incredibly indebted and grateful to Ruth, but ready and empowered to take the next step. And, and Ruth herself, who felt this sort of uncertainty of how, you know, of, of how she could manage the transition, you know, it, they came away with different memories, but in the end, the outcome was the same. So, yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think maybe the reason I said we should do others is because I realized pretty quickly that you could write a whole book on that. System. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I think people have actually, like yeah. at least, uh, dissertations. Um, I'm wondering if we can go from, from one female CEO to another in that, uh, um, in that, uh, gender and, the uh, the gender lens really in our work is something that has been, that we've certainly been sensitive to from the very, very early days of, of uh, leading edge and certainly in leadership in general, in that the Jewish nonprofit sector is a sector made up of women. So our workforce is predominantly women and yet it's led predominantly by men. And I'm wondering if there were any sort of lessons that you teased out as, uh, as you, you unearthed some of these stories and certainly given your experience in other ways about what are some ways that we might be able to uh, cajole, to encourage, to support women as they think about that final mile in the corner office of the CEO? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I know we've got time for questions at the end, but I saw something that popped up, um, you know, about this. I, I think the question was about AJWS oh. and who they use for consultants. They actually went through a series of consultants. They weren't entirely happy with them. But if the question is about um, uh, uh, Ruth and Robert's transition, actually, what was interesting is that Ruth volunteered to use Robert's existing executive coach. That's right. That was a really nice gesture. It showed that she was going to meet Robert on his terms with someone that, you know, he was comfortable with so that this wasn't going to be, you know, that it wasn't even going to be a neutral arbiter. It was going to be uh, someone who really had, you know, who was in Robert's corner and could kind of like serve Robert and give Robert what he needed for a successful transition. Um, I'm not dodging the question about, uh, you know, about yeah. equality at the top of leadership, but it's just such a complicated question um, and a thorny one to untangle, right? I mean, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, there's so many, there's so many things that might contribute to this gender disparity. There's this, you know, paucity of female role models, women's lack of access to sponsors, these like so-called pink ghettos where women get stuck in certain roles where they don't have leadership opportunities. That being said, you can't pass the buck as a search committee. And as a, um, uh, it's your duty to make sure that you have uh, that you consider a diverse pool. And it's in your interest too, right? I mean, um, if you only have people sitting in front of you that look like you and think like you, where's the innovation going to come from? Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that came out of the Bend the Arc uh, case was that how meager good intentions are, you know? So what, what I mean by that is that uh, you can... Women will often, one of the problems that we have is that women will often self-select out of. Yeah. yeah, we hear that all the time. Yeah. yeah, And I think part of the reason is because, uh, you know, women are generally more risk averse. There's a whole host of research. There was one professor who I, uh, whose research I, I cite in the case study who, who interviewed uh, potential um, uh, candidates for uh, state government in Texas, I believe. And she said, what percentage chance would you have to have to consider running for, you know, governor or the next level? I can't quite remember. But for men, it was like basically zero. If I've got like, you know, if you're telling me I got a one in a million chance, I'm going for it. For women, it was more like, I need to know I've got a very good chance of succeeding, mm -hmm. getting this. And that's, that, that, you know, so with Ben, uh, with Ben the Ark, they had this incredibly uh, forceful, charismatic, talented executive in Stash Cutler. I mean, this is a tough cookie, right? I think she's black belt in the martial arts. It's really kind of gritty background. Um, 
And even, and, and she's also, you know, she's very active because of the organization and progressive politics and gender equality is something that she thinks a lot about. And so she knew, she was aware of the research that women will often sort of duck their heads when it comes time to like, you know, applying for CEO roles. And she still almost fell for it, right? She still felt like she read the job description and she's like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is for me, et cetera. Hmm. And what, came, what happened is that the board, you know, a couple things. One, you know, I think the board really, you know, really pushed her. They really, you know, and they, they didn't sugarcoat it. They said, yeah, I'm sure that you have gaps and you have weaknesses. Almost all the candidates that we would look at will. We will help you fill those gaps and those, those weaknesses. Um, I think that gave her confidence to sort of step forward. Um, and then I think that something else that, you know, that happened that uncovers sort of one of these, how, why gender equality needs to be addressed, addressed systemically. You know, she had been part of a leadership development program, I think 15 years before. Right. And the fact that she was part, she was, uh, you know, in a cohort that had gone on um, to become leaders in the Jewish community provided a support network of people who had walked the walk who could say, of course you can do this. You know, we know you, you're super talented. Like, this is, this is a great opportunity for you. And so eventually she, you know, she put her name forward and, 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 and she got the job, but she could have, you know, this could have easily have been one of those dogs that didn't bark. You might never have known of Stash Kotler's potential as a CEO because she never would have had the opportunity if, uh, you know, if, if she hadn't have had the, 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 the sort of gentle pushing from the board. You know, one other interesting thing about that is, you know, to, to follow up this idea of like, you know, treating her professionally uh, as toxically a way to instill confidence. You know, they put her through the ringer when it came time to assess an interview, you know? They weren't like, oh, well, you're nervous about taking this position, so we'll, we'll treat you with kid gloves. I mean, they, you know, and I think that actually paradoxically sort of, you know, showed her that, um, you know, she could handle, the, she could handle the pressure that this was not uh, a token appointment, um, that this was a serious assessment process, and it gave her more confidence in herself than if she had felt like she had just been kind of rubber mm -hmm. Yeah, a mentor of mine once said, you know, there's a whole this, this debate about are leaders born, are they made, or, and he was like, you know what, they're forged. Mm. And that, that's a, it's a beautiful way of, of, uh, of really what, what Stosh probably endured and uh, uh, certainly made her one of the, the most inspiring leaders that we have in our community. Mm. Um, when we also, when we think about search and the role of boards, there are, there is this aspect of transparency that we get a lot of calls about with, especially since we we're now doing a little bit more um, work in terms of research on CO search and, and, um, and some of the best practices they're in. So people reach out for advice. And one of the biggest questions for search committees and specifically the chairs of search committees is, you know, we run an organization that has a lot of assets, that has concentric circles of constituents. We are not sure how to bring them in in what way What's, what's a good way to manage the communications? How much is too much? There are different camps. Some people want a voice. Some people want to vote. Some people want to veto. Help. What do we do? And, uh, and I'm wondering if there's uh, the research and the stories may point to some advice on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so, you know, def so I, I, I've heard it described that, you know, CEO secessions and, you know, and nonprofits are sort of like marriages or funerals. They're an opportunity for the community to kind of come together or, or splinter apart. Um, and, and I think it needs to be seen as an opportunity to sort of uh, strengthen the entire community, um, not just the organization. And you can't do that without uh, transparency and, and buy-in from the community. Um, you know, I, I to, to, to switch over to healthcare for a second, you know, there's this thing, HIPAA, it's this uh, law, mm -hmm patient privacy and it's all you know it's very uh valid and um you know it's a valid concern but i feel like a lot of healthcare organizations like hide behind hipaa when it comes time to like sharing patient data with other hospitals or whatever you know i feel like there's something similar around confidentiality and searches mm -hmm. where there's a sense of oh well we have to protect the confidentiality confidentiality of the candidates totally true and absolute essential but that doesn't mean that you recess to like, you know, the darkened back room and, and, and do the entire process, you know, out of, out of sight. And I think that, um, you know, a good example of that is combined Jewish philanthropies in Boston, mm -hmm. um, which was running a very high profile search, uh, um, 
a very active community, uh, you know, the, a lot of smart, savvy people in the community that have experience with, uh, you know, hiring and managing high level talent. Um, and they could have easily sort of just basically, uh, you know, pulled, pulled, pulled the curtain back and done it behind closed doors. But instead they, you know, they fostered this real spirit of openness and they ran, you know, for example, they ran, um, uh, their own dedicated website where they basically get dated updates on the search. Um, the two search committee, the two, so the, there's a whole funny side story about how essentially they got two CEOs of billion dollar companies to basically run the search, which is pretty incredible. But they had these two very high profile people, Aaron Ain and, um, uh, Goodwin, is that name? Yeah. Uh, Goodman, Shira Goodman. Yeah. Shira Goodman. Yeah. yeah. CEO of Staples. They had, uh, they were running the search together. Um, and Aaron basically had this open door policy. Um, he said, I'll take a call from anyone. And he literally fielded hundreds of calls yeah. uh, with people. And he took every, he had a little book and he took everyone's recommendations. They worked with a high profile search consultancy, Spencer Stewart, um, who, uh, sent out a, uh, uh, a survey to an email list with over 10,000 people on it, as I understand it. Um, they, uh, ran, town hall focus groups around Boston with various constituencies that were going to be important. Um, and they, you know, they kept a very close touch with, you know, their major seven figure donors. Um, now there's kind of this open question of what role donors should play in a search process. And, you know, that's something we can explore in greater detail. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of unique to the nonprofit world. Um, but I think in this instance, uh, you know, uh, they handled it incredibly well. Um, they had, I think, uh, one or two major donors on the search committee, um, but they, they, you know, their rule was if you're going to be on the search committee as a donor, it's because you have experience hiring top mm -hmm. talent. Um, and then for those that didn't, for those that they, uh, you know, for those that they kept off the search committee, um, they, they made proactive outreach to explain why, to explain that they wanted a diversity of opinions and they already had a couple major donors. Um, uh, they explained how they were, out, you know, doing outreach to all the, you know, important constituencies. And then before the appointment was announced, they actually reached out to all of their seven figure donors, and essentially said, you know, here's who we selected. Here's why, here's why we think it's going to be great. And, you know, as a courtesy, we just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, so, uh, you know, but it wasn't just the seven figure donors, right? I mean, they, 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 you know, if you were interested in CJP search, you had an abundance of information and access to, I mean, I find it difficult to get the CEO of multi-billion dollar companies on the phone, but you know, if you were interested in their search at this point, you know, you could have, um, you could, you could have talked to Aaron. And I think that's kind of, you know, incredible display of openness that really, I think, I think paid off, um, yeah. uh, you know, when the search was completed. Yeah, and we have a question that just came in about um, any best practices for how, what, when to communicate with an organization's staff. And CJP is actually an interesting one because didn't they have one of the mm -hmm. staff yeah, members they on put the COO yeah. onto the search committee, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I wouldn't actually I wouldn't actually advise because uh, mm -hmm. um, if you're going to have confidential discussions about a candidate's strength or weakness. Uh, maybe perhaps you offer the role to your first choice, they turn it down, you go with the second choice. That's not something that really, I don't think someone who works under that person needs, needs or should know. I think mm. it undermines the new executive as they come in, as they came in. But in this instance, they felt that they, they had someone who uh, could represent the interests of the staff, had no aspirations for the CEO role themselves. And, and, and you know, everyone said uh, that, you know, including Spencer Stewart, or you know, well schooled in this, and who I think at the time advised them not to put her on the search committee, said that you know it worked out really well. And um, I mean, I guess that's a credit to the COO that she was able to handle that responsibility as well. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, you know staff, I mean, I, I think that like you know, there's no there's no right answer. I think that you know probably the you want to you want to undertake the the sort of fact finding um, uh, questioning that you would for any important constituency. So, you know, you're asking questions such as what are the qualities that the, that the new CEO should have, that the old CEO didn't, you know, fast forward four or five years, tell us where you imagine this organization to be. Uh, what are some things about, the, you know, often just direct generic, uh, direct generic question, like what are some things about this search that we might not know that we should know? 
you know, what, what, what we not, you know, is there anything that has been kind of kept from our view by the incumbent CEO that we need to know about? You know, you don't want any blind spots as the search. Um, so, so early on, it's kind of a, you know, it's a one way sort of listening. I think once you, all of the finalists should meet with staff and I think they should be introduced as finalists and I think it should be part of their tour. And I, I think it's important that you let the staff know that they're not interviewing the candidate. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it's an opportunity to get to know them, um, et cetera. And I, I, you know, I'm not sure that you even ask for the staff's assessments at that point. I think maybe perhaps you ask for any red flags. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, that the, the CEO, the, the, the CEO finalist candidates will want to meet the staff. They'll want to see, you know, the physical orientation of the office. They'll, you know, there's no way to really kind of do that without sort of, you know, you can't pretend that they're like the pizza delivery man, right? Like, <laughs> people to everyone, so, um, uh, or woman, pizza delivery woman. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and it sounds like more than anything, you treat them like an important constituency, like, you know, the others. So there is an attention and a sensitivity to the fact that these folks are going to get a new leader. They're going to need to be at least uh, knowing that that process is happening and some of the details that are material, depending on, you know, the process uh, as it unfolds over time. Yeah, and, and uh, always, always a lot of art around that, not just pure science. Um, it looks like we have another question that came in. This is fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, common trends of hiring a new executive and they leave within one to two years. Um, would it be advisable to hire a purely interim executive director while the role is restructured? Also separate questions about the trend of hiring CEO talent from outside the nonprofit sector. All right, so a lot here. Um, uh, th this question does go to one of the one of the questions that, that I had in terms of um, part of the part of the trend of these seventy five percent of CEOs turning over. They're taking over for for uh, new CEOs are going to be taking over for the CEOs who've been there for decades. So again, if we look at Ruth, if we look at Barry, if we look at Abe Foxman at the Anti Defamation League, and on and on and on. And what what there is a trend uh, or we're not sure actually, and this is Evan, hopefully you can help us, is uh, some of the time the, the folks who are the new CEO who's taken over for that individual who's been there for you know, decades and, and certainly a long tenure uh, do end up leaving within, let's call it a two year window. And there is sort of a, this churn of, of, uh, of CEOs. I'm wondering if that is something that you've seen um, uh, in our community and throughout, if that is something and, and what how we may be able to mitigate that. And I think the second question of interim director um, might be uh, one of the ways in which uh, we can mitigate that fallout. Yeah, that's a, so that's a great question. So, um, uh, and make sure that I answer it. Um, uh, um, so uh, I think there is a sense uh, often that after a long serving CEO, you need sort of a decompression chamber. Um, and so thinking of it, you know, I don't want to call it, I like to think of an interim CEO. I like to think of that title. I mean, it's semantics, but I like to think of that title as someone who comes in for like a period of months to oversee like a succession crisis during a search. And perhaps a transition CEO would be the mm -hmm. that I would prefer for someone who would come in and help the organization get ready and transition for its next long-term leader. Um, that allows you often to bring in someone of similar age and stature as the outgoing CEO. Um, and, you know, someone who perhaps uh, has similar, you know, ha has a proven track record, but just, you know, isn't, isn't in it for the long haul. Um, I think that that can be a viable option. I think another instance where you might think of a, you know, a tour of duty short tenure is for a turnaround. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that um, with the story of this uh, JCC in the Midwest. Um, I don't know how long um, the CEO will actually end up being in place there, but he was brought in for a specific task, which was a turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the CEOs that have turnaround experience don't tend to be the type of CEOs that want to stick around for a couple of days. Hal Lewis, right? It's Burtis. That was kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's a good point. So Hal was there. I think he ended up being there, I don't know. Was it like 10 seven, years. Seven, <laughs> 10 years, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, he was brought in for, for a turnaround. And when he felt that, 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 you know, he had sort of righted the ship, I mean, when he took over, gosh, it was in the wake of the 2008 crisis. There was the organization that was overextended with real estate investments. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there was talk that it would go bankrupt. And he essentially... 
you know, right at the ship. And when he felt that he had stabilized, it was his time to turn it to, to, to step aside. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think that a lot of this will, will, will be sorted through when it comes time to uh, do the strategic review, um, which is different from strategic planning. But when you do the review, when it comes time to, to, to sort of scope the role, mm-hmm. uh, you'll start to figure out what kind of executive are we looking for now? Um, and, uh, you know, um, you can, there were various tools for this. You can do kind of a SWOT analysis. You know, you, one of the things that I, you know, one of the things that I recommended in, in the best practices guide that I think might be useful is, you know, to ask these courageous questions, mm-hmm. right? Should this organization continue? Would we better serve the community if we were to gift our, you know, our, our services to another organization? Um, and if it is going to continue, what is its unique value at? What, what role mm-hmm. play um, and how do we get there? Uh, and, you know, when you start kind of dealing with those questions, maybe it starts to kind of clarify in your mind what kind of executive you, you're, you're actually looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, it's a it's a really great point. I'm sorry to interrupt, but please. in some ways, this this question is, is very um, is is tied to the fact that we know that many boards don't have conversations with their CEO, like you said in the beginning of this, of planning, just planning. It goes to also annual evaluation. Only 50% really of of boards in general, nonprofit boards actually annually evaluate the performance of the CEO. And so what ends up happening is that they they do go into a CEO search process with a, we'll know it when we'll see it kind of, mm. you know, profile of, of uh, which also tends to favor men because they're more charismatic and, and are able to talk about their, their time. So there is a, there is a contributing factor that this question, that there's always a question of, uh, for me around, you know, how did the organization get this way? In many ways, it's because there were, there wasn't that strategic review process, the courageous question. So like, where do we want to be in five years? And therefore, what's the profile of the leader that we need? In some ways, we saw that a little bit in the Tuftillo case. Right, the profile of, you know, do you need a do you need a Jeff Summit who has been there in the role for thirty years? Do we want somebody who was, uh, in, in some ways, the where Jeff was at the beginning of his tenure as CEO? What does the organization need now? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's no right answer to that. I mean, I, I remember, you know, I visited the JFK Museum, which is outside Boston, and uh, the arch. It's a beautiful building, and the architect for that was selected by. Uh, Jackie Onassis um, uh, against, you know, more experienced uh, architects because he got her, you know, he said, you know, Jackie, I feel like I'm on the verge of my best work. And that, you know, and that reminded her of, you know, her husband who was herself himself a young president and the sense of potential and getting someone at the height of their powers and their career, not when they've already, you know, summited. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, it can be a shock for a young executive to step into to re- immediately replace a long serving um, CEO, and I think that uh, that was that 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 conversation was one that the Tufts Hillel board grappled with, um, and ultimately what they decided was that it wasn't about tenure, it wasn't about age, it was about you know gravitas. They actually they needed someone who had the same gravitas as the outgoing CEO, and um, you know I don't want to say that they you know they picked like a young replacement, but you know y- you know I'd say sort of mid career kind of uh, replacement mm-hmm. of Tali is and. Um, but, you know, with incredible scholarship behind him, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, yeah, there's no right answer for the type of candidate that you're looking for. There's also no right answer as to whether your organization needs some breathing space between two long serving executives. I don't, I don't think necessarily that having a transition CEO is, is a sign of weakness. Um, uh, you know, it can be, it can be a sign of poor planning, but it doesn't need to be if it's intentional. Mm -hmm. This goes also to the second part of the question of, you know, there's a, there is a, uh, in some cases, a pattern. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a theme or trend that we do end up um, hiring CEO talent outside of the nonprofit space. So somehow that private sector corporate experience, the not nonprofit uh, experience is somehow um, the message that the rest of the pipeline, if you will, in the field gets is somehow that's of higher value than what they're getting day in, day out. And I'm wondering, you know, you, the majority of your time, honestly, apart from, I think, this, this little project is spent in the corporate sector, is spent in the private sector. And I'm wondering, what, do you, what have you seen as it relates to leadership development, as it re- relates to CEO succession in the corporate world? And, and how do we compare? Um, 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so let me address this this issue, this issue of is it advisable to hire people from outside of the, you know, I think that those people are more because it, in some ways it's sort of, uh, you know, I think those people end up being more high profile of all the six kind of high profile cases that we featured, you know, not all of them were from within the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, for the interviews that, you know, I know that this is happening, but it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not happening everywhere all the time. Um, uh, I, the one person that I spoke to in my research who was from the uh, for-profit world uh, kind of made an interesting warning, which is like, you know, the sense that maybe for-profit executives will leave their high-powered corporate job for a nonprofit for lifestyle reasons is insanity, right? Like a nonprofit CEO is, go is a very much a full-time job and very demanding. And I think that, you know, that needs to be made clear to candidates who maybe feel like they're looking, they're moving to nonprofit because they want to change a pace or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. That's just the one insight I had from that one interview. You know, an area where I can speak, you know, sort of more authoritatively on is this idea of like the for profit world. And I got to say, like, you know, there's no corporate savior here, right? Like, it, it, you know, it, this is some CEO secessions is, is not something you know, that's done particularly well in the corporate arena either. You know, I think there was this, um, uh, Stanford did this study in 2010 that only, they found that only 54% of boards were grooming a specific successor and 40% had no viable internal, internal candidate who could immediately replace the CEO if the need arose, right? Um, I think part of what's happening is that, you know, the trends that you describe are making it harder, uh, you know, uh, with, with job hopping and shorter tenures. Um, but this is at a moment in time, right, when corporate secessions are happening, happening more frequently than right. ever before, right? right? You have activist investors pushing out CEOs, um, you have baby boomers themselves retiring. So you've got 15% or so of corporations that need to replace their CEO. Uh, but very, you know, but you know, only sort of a, a small majority that are actually ready to do so. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there are, you know, there is research that shows that those companies that do well, that do do handle this well, uh, creates, uh, a, you know, an excessive amount of like value. Um, so uh, there, there was a study of, you know, the so-called CEO factories such as GE, IBM, Procter and Gamble, um, and it found the stock market reacted positively when CEOs that had come through these leadership training programs were appointed and they delivered superior operating performance over the next three years. Um, so there's, there, you know, there are companies that do it well, there are companies that don't do it well. And let's also remember that the majority of businesses in the for-profit for sector are family owned and have a lot of the same dysfunctions as, uh, you know, as the, as the most cloistered kind of like community nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I, you know, my job essentially is to, to is to function is to focus on dysfunction and try and banish the practice of bad management. So I do focus on sort of like the things that you know for profit boards don't do well. But I can tell you, you know, unfortunately, one of those things tends to be CEO succession. The board are too busy. They're dealing with risk and dealing with finance and all, all kinds of other functions, and they don't put enough time aside for um, you know succession work, even in the for profit. Yeah. World. Even so yeah, in, in some way that's reassuring, but that's like, you know, everyone's not doing it well. So that's not the bar that we all want to work toward. Um, but you bring up interesting points in that we know in the Jewish community also, we have our own GEs and IBMs and whatnot. We know that a lot of the leadership factories run through camps, as an example. Like this is where people are actually able to get 360 degrees of skill development, of real, you know, experiential kind of um, hands-on, dirt under the fingernails type of um, type of experience, which then leads, leads them to the, the kind of skills that, that can be built upon when, you, when you're thinking of senior leaders and, and certainly CEOs. Um, really, really interesting to think about in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And I guess it goes back to that point we made with Ben the Ark and this, this, this sort of like the, the long term payout for leadership development programs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, golly, so I'm, apologies, I don't know this off the top of my head, but you guys run a leadership development. Yes, training? we do. Yes, we do. We, uh, okay. uh, yes, we do for new, for new CEOs. In fact, we, we, um, um, 
uh, you can go on until one. People have been asking questions throughout, so it's all good. Thank you, Tamar. I guess. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, it's it's twelve fifty three on the east yeah. on the east coast here. Um, yes, we do, and and it's really they're geared toward new CEOs. So CEOs okay. have been in their role for two years or less because there's such a churn in the C suite. We know that no CEO is on maintenance mode. Certainly not a new CEO that has a steep learning curve. And so what we want is to ameliorate some of the loneliness that happens just by virtue of being in that top role. So it's a cohort-based leadership development program. They get a coach. They get the kind of interventions that a Center for Creative Leadership can, can really help with some of the adaptive challenges that you're trying to lead. And we found it to be you know, incredibly helpful from a, from a cohort and, and a support perspective, certainly from a, um, asking questions about you know, very huge problems that they're trying to, um, to, to change and, and the leadership of, of uh, uh, and how that's manifested. So those, those cohort based. So how would you answer that question about this, you know, this, this, this concern that executives are leaving within one or two years? Yeah. Well, honestly, that's, that's where we look at, okay, well, what were the bill of sale that they were sold? Right. Mm -hmm. And it all goes back to the board. I mean, in many, many ways in the search committees, I mean, it really goes back to the work that we did. I hate to you know, sound like an infomercial or something, but it's, it's true. There is, there is a lack of planning. There's a lack of clarity about the kind of, of leader that is needed. A lot of times charisma supersedes the kinds of skills that are maybe less sexy, but certainly critical that our organizations need. And, and also we know that we're looking to some extent for unicorns. Like these people don't exist. Like you can't do the, the charisma and the this and the that and, and then be able to like balance the books and also manage the internal and then like do it for our tour at the beginning of everything that's going to, you know, bring tears to people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And that I think is just a, the, the kind of expectations that the board has on the new leader, that being mismatched, which was heard by the new leader and then how that's received by the actual user and the team, that's where it's just, that's where the breakdown is. Yeah, I mean, there's a wonderful headline in an article that we published uh, in praise of the incomplete leader, and essentially this idea that you know boards, uh, you know, should start thinking about team-based competency with the entire executive suite. Yeah, up looking for kind of you know the CEO savior or the ED savior. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I think that you know, I, I, I think that might be um, you know an easier way to sort of uh, set CEOs up for success is to sort. You know, when you're looking at scoping the role, you can start thinking about the holistic executive suite that you have and how their talents uh, match up uh, and strengths and weaknesses. Well. Yeah. Yeah. There's another question. This is um, thank you, Clarman Family Foundation. This is uh, very much apropos of, of, of our audience. What are some things that funders, some non board members, but certainly folks who wield influence, power, and certainly resources can do to help uh, to be helpful in succession? Yeah, so this goes back to the question we had about the role of donors, right? Um, and uh, I can, you know, I can imagine that it would be frustrating for a foundation to see this vacuum, this competency vacuum, and not want to step in and sort of say, okay, we're going to essentially, you know, run the search for you, or we're going to stand up a consulting arm to help with the search. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I don't think that that's, uh, the most enlightened way to go about doing it. I think that like, um, you know, it's important to, to understand as a, as, a, as a large kind of uh, donor organization, you're one of many sort of stakeholders and constituencies and shouldn't dominate the process. That being said, you know, maybe, maybe there's opportunities to, to fund support from consultants or, or search executives. Um, and, you know, also I think that uh, not to plug your program, but I think one of the things we're hearing is the importance of like the, 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 the importance of entering earlier in the funnel. So talking to your organizations about what are they doing to identify successors? How are they evaluating their CEO? How are they tying those evaluations to succession planning? Um, you know, how far, do, how well do they know the organization? Can they, can they name two or three people below the executive director that have leadership potential? Um, you know, and then funding some of these cohort cohort groups for future leaders. I think you know that 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 pays off as well. Um, start building your your bullpen, and then you know you won't pull your head head out when you, you know you can't find a reliever. Yeah, you bring up such a great point, which is questions. Like whenever funders ask questions of organizations, of course we're going to pay attention. 
And so asking some of those questions really sends a, a subtle and not so subtle signal that there's, there's some there's an importance to thinking ahead. There's an importance to wanting to know where the organization is in planning so that it's not an emergency. And, um, and potentially there are some resources to help with some of those pl that planning. Um, the other thing that we hear honestly is, is uh, when an organization goes through a CO transition, um, and I'm not talking about the, the more complicated ones and the ones that are maybe more in crisis, um, that there isn't this aspect from a funder perspective of we'll wait and see we're going to withhold our funding until the new ceo comes in and then we're going to see if we're going to continue funding and that that is absolutely something that's important to to weigh in as as uh, you know we think about different investments in our field but the in some ways there's, there's an argument to be made for an organization going through a ceo transition for a funder to double down during that time, because it is such a, a vulnerable and high risk yet high reward potential type of time. Um, so, so not adding to the potential risk by saying, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to withhold funding until, you know, we know who the new uh, jockey is. That's yeah. I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but you know, do you, you can do that without, I mean, you can kind of like, you, you don't need to advertise that, right? You can kind of think to yourself, well, I'm not sure how long our relationship is going to be depending on where the new leadership takes this organization, but you don't need to like, you know, shove that in the board's face. It's kind of, right. kind of right. Un right. understood. I would imagine like if our new CEO blows up this organization, we're probably going to, our funding is going to dry up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Different, different perspectives on that. Tamar, we, I'm sorry. We didn't ever transition officially to Q and A. Evan, this perfect. was too fun. I, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dolly. Yeah. This was <laughs> wonderful. And thank you every, all the participants for being so actively involved during this session and for the, uh, for Gali and Evan for being so open to taking, for taking them and going where, where the participants wanted to go. And so I wanted, I know we're just out of time, but if, if, do you have any last words just to, to wrap up? I know we could go on for hours more in this important topic. And I do want to want to reiterate to everybody that they should read some of the case studies or all of the case studies. I looked at it um, and you would think it would be so dense and it is so dense with data and information, but it's such an easy read. And I really feel like everybody from wherever you're sitting can gain can gain an understanding of the search and also gain things for themselves professionally of ways to, to think. So I wanted to give another, another um, plug for that. We're going to have it on the JFN website. Um, and I'm sure you can also find it on Leaning Edge's website. Yeah. So with that, um, I want to say thank you and then also give you a chance to, to have a, a quick closing if you, if you want. Evan, any any final words? <laughs> no, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I, I've been incredibly grateful to collaborate with you and write for this, um, you know, for this important constituency. And uh, you know, um, every crisis is also an opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, I think how the community handles this, um, what's being called a CEO EV secession crisis in the next five or ten years, is going to have a, an outsized impact on. Um, the health of, uh, and vibrancy of the community. And, and to be honest, the country and the world, given, given the outsized role that Jews play in, um, yeah. in the health of all of that. So, uh, you know, it's great to work on something of such high impact and with such talented people. So thank you, Dolly. Wonderful. Thank you, Evan. And thank you, Tamar and, and everyone. Really, and if there are any questions, I'm certainly looking forward to answering any of them through Leading Edge and, and wanting to keep the conversation going. Wonderful. Thank you all. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.